Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. The Wudang Mountains are a small mountain range in Hubei Province in central China. Historically, the mountains have had a strong association with Taoism. The numerous Taoist monasteries found there were known as centers of learning, where monks taught meditation, martial arts, traditional Chinese medicine, agriculture, and the arts. Well, in 1994, the monasteries and other buildings of the Wudan Mountains earned recognition from UNESCO when they were listed as a World Heritage Site. What UNESCO termed the ancient building complex in the Wudan Mountains contains some of the finest examples of Taoist architecture from a period covering a thousand years, dating all the way back to the seventh century. But there is something rather curious about the UNESCO listing. The site excludes the most important structure and entrance to the ancient complex, Jingle Palace. When the ancient building complex on Wudang Mountain was selected for inclusion in the World Cultural Heritage List, people with knowledge of Chinese history were puzzled at the fact that the most significant structure in the complex, Jingle Palace, was missing from the list of buildings. Regarded as the entrance to the complex. This palace was too famous to have simply been forgotten. If it were not in the complex, where was it? The answer is certainly a surprise. For more than 40 years, the palace, together with the ancient city of Zhuangzhou, where it was located, has been submerged in 60 meters of water. Several questions naturally arise: What was the palace like? How did it come to end up 60 meters underwater? And what happened to the cultural relics once housed in the palace? In the 1950s, the 2,000-year-old city of Zhuangzhou, by the Hanjiang River, northwest Hubei Province, was the county seat of Zhuangxian. But even today, the locals prefer the name Zhuangzhou to the more recent name Zhuangxian. Construction of the magnificent Jingle Palace began in the year 1418 by the Edict of Zhu Di, Emperor Yongle of the Ming Dynasty. The palace was to be a temporary residence for Emperor Yongle, a pious follower of Taoism, whenever he made pilgrimages to the south. It would be close to both the Hanjiang River and the famous Wudang Mountain, a sacred place in the Taoist religion, particularly to the religion's Jen Wu sect. However, after the palace was completed in 1424, the emperor never came. Although the emperor never made it to his magnificent palace in the south. He nonetheless valued it. Before taking up the throne, he had for years been a prince based in Beijing, and when he became the emperor, he had famously moved his capital from Nanjing to Beijing. For this reason, Jingle Palace was constructed very much along the lines of the Forbidden City, although, of course, on a much smaller scale. But how did the palace come to completely disappear? In 1958, construction began on Danjiang Kou Reservoir. It was a vital project of national significance, but it was based in the vicinity of the palace. Yuan 如有可能，借点水是可以的。这个正是毛泽东主席这一诙谐幽默的语言，这个构成了我们南水北调的一个最初的一个蓝图。Earlier that year, Chairman Mao Zedong went on an inspection tour along the Yangtze aboard a navy ship, accompanied by Lin Yishan, chief of the Yangtze River Planning Office. The chairman was studying a map of the Yangtze when he pointed to the spot where the Hanjiang and Danjiang rivers meet. The Hanjiang River, the biggest tributary of the Yangtze, originated in southwest Shanxi and joined the Yangtze in the city of Wuhan in Hubei Province. The Danjiang River 
was born in the same place as the Hanjiang, but it flowed past Hunan province before joining the Hanshui River in the northwest of Hubei province. The point where the Hanjiang and Danjiang rivers join is surrounded by mountains, making it an ideal place to build a large reservoir that would change the Hanjiang plains history of having a flood in two out of every three years. The reservoir would not only generate electricity and irrigate farmland, but would also serve as a water source for the soon to be constructed Southern Water to the North project, as the reservoir would be located at a much higher altitude compared with Beijing. In theory, the water destined for the north would not need to be pumped. Today, the fact that the Southern Water to the North project is still functioning shows that it was, indeed, an inspired project. On March the 25th, 1958, the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee made its decision. The Danjiang Core Reservoir would be built. When the time came to establish the command headquarters for the project, Premier Zhao Enlai selected Zhang Tixue, the provincial governor of Hubei province, to be its chief. However, construction of such a massive reservoir would take up large areas of both Hubei and Hunan provinces, and as the ancient city of Junzhou was right in the centre, it would be lost together with Jinglu Palace. Following the orders of the State Council, in 1958 a leading group for the relocation of cultural relics was established, also headed by Zhang Tixiu, the provincial governor of Hubei province and the person in charge of the Danjiang Gong Reservoir Construction Project. His <laughs> Jinshan 这么大一个建筑，哪些办，哪些不办，怎么办，由谁来办？ Apparently, it's not easy to find the answers to all these questions. But one thing we do know is what the original Jingle Palace looks like. From today's eye, this whole building is a huge building. Its strength is from the Ming Dynasty in the 1950s. 它高八米，宽四米。说城内的街道啊，也都是青石铺路，两面全是这个明清建筑。这个金乐宫的这个围墙呢，也是用大青砖来砌成。不过呢，原始的房屋现在已经剩下不多了，大概还有七十多间。In the course of its history, the palace had suffered three fires. This, combined with the effects of many wars that took place during the years of the Republic of China period, meant that by the time of the founding of New China, the palace was in a dilapidated condition. Yet the palace's main hall was still standing, and most of the relics were intact. When a survey of the site was conducted in 1956 by a team from Hubei province, it was found that the number of cultural relics stored inside numbered around a thousand. These relics included beautiful utensils sent by the emperor for worship ceremonies, inscribed boards, statues made of various materials, and stone steles.
After considering the situation carefully, the Danjiang Coal Reservoir Leading Group decided that the cultural relics were to be relocated. All the finest relics, together with the most elaborately made parts of the palace itself, would be entered in a list, and everything on the list would be moved. Everything else would be left. Amid deafening explosions, on September the 1st, 1958, 100,000 workers from across the country began construction of the gigantic Danjiang Coal Reservoir. With the project now underway, the relocation of the cultural relics had to proceed at full speed. The relics to be relocated would first be transported out of the city and then loaded onto ships bound for their new home 40 kilometers away in Zhengzhou Township today's Danjiangko municipality. This very rare photograph was taken when the relics were being transported. In it, we can see the towering city gate and a huge stone turtle being moved out through it. No modern transportation or lifting machinery is visible. Workers are using only the most primitive methods, edging the huge stone carving forward on logs. These huge carvings were the palace's prized possessions. There were two of them, each sheltered by a pavilion, one to the east and the other to the west of the palace. Each of the massive stone turtles carries on its back a stele bearing edicts from Emperor Yongle concerning the construction of Jingle Palace. Because of these edicts, the steles and the turtles carrying them are of great historical significance. From bottom to top, this turtle and the stele on it is 8.5 metres tall. The crown of the stele alone weighs 8.5 tonnes and its body weighs 17 tonnes. Of the two turtles, this one is the heavier, weighing in total an extraordinary 76 tonnes. Even today, moving such a heavy relic a distance of 40 kilometres would be no easy job, even with the assistance of modern machinery. The job of shifting the stone turtles began shortly after the relocation work started, around April and May of 1960, and the demanding task was the responsibility of the number three company of construction workers. Poorly equipped, lacking even a crane, the company faced a mountainous task. Zhang Tixiu, the chief of the Danjiang Coal Reservoir Construction Project and the governor of Hubei province, encouraged workers by saying, if the ancients were able to get them here 500 years ago, we can certainly move them today. After ideas on how to go about the task were collected at all levels, a plan to transport the giant stone turtles was finalised. With a dozen or more huge timbers obtained from timber-rich Yunnan province, the workers constructed a rig above the turtle and tied the turtle using the strongest steel cables available. After carefully prising the stone turtle loose from its base using crowbars, it was lifted up by hand-operated pulleys. The lifted turtle was placed on a support of several layers, the first comprised of vertical sleepers, the second of horizontal logs and seamless steel pipes, and a third of vertical sleepers again. With dozens of people pulling from the front and an equal number of people pushing from behind, Inch by inch, the giant turtle began to move. As the turtle moved forward, the sleepers, seamless steel pipes and logs that emerged at the back were carried to the front to extend the support. As they toiled, the workers sang chants to cheer themselves along. Hey, 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 
At the time, a description of the workers moving the massive stone turtle compared them to ants gnawing at a bone. And it was, of course, a very slow process. Each day, the turtle was moved just 20 or 30 meters. Although the total distance involved was less than a kilometer from the eastern city gate to the nearby Hanjian Wharf, the task took more than 20 days, as several obstacles lay in the turtle's path. Here we can see a steep slope just outside the city gate. How were the workers able to control the huge inertial force from the giant turtle as they moved it down the steep incline? Besides the two huge turtles, there was another giant that had to be relocated. This was the decorated stone archway that stood in front of Jingle Palace. Lingxing Archway features six columns that support a structure resembling five stories and five rooms. Truly impressive and highly valuable as a work of art, the archway was built using the bracket lock technique often found in traditional wooden structures. Many regard Lingxing Archway as one of the finest stone archways ever made during the Ming Dynasty. The structure of the archway is complicated and it has over 200 parts. Just as with the stone turtle, the relocation workers dismantled the stone structure, loaded the parts onto carts, took them away by tractor and loaded them onto a ship. Xia Ke, the Deputy General Director of the Danjiangko Reservoir Project, set off with his men in search of a suitable location for the Jingle Palace relics. Eventually, he decided upon an ideal site, the long northern slope of Mount Jingang not far from the soon-to-be-constructed dam. It had mountains on three sides and water in front. In time, all the relocated relics would be stored in a warehouse by the soon-to-be-built dam. Fortunately, with the arrival of machinery, the relocation work was able to proceed at a faster pace. Then in 1967, the reservoir began to take on water, and the ancient city of Junzhou and Jingle Palace inside the city was submerged. In 1965, the Danjiangko Construction Bureau began work on the reconstruction of Jingle Palace. But then, just as the bases for the stone turtles were completed and the two turtles were about to be placed on them, the Cultural Revolution began and the construction work came to a sudden halt. Sadly, many stone relics were taken away by local residents for use as materials in the construction of pigsties and toilets. However, in 1983, when Junxian County officially adopted the name Danjiangko Municipality, there arose an outcry demanding the resumption of the reconstruction of the palace and the proper protection of the relocated relics. The media quickly picked up on this public sentiment. And so in 1987, Danjiangko Municipality, still on the list of the nation's most impoverished areas, began preparations to resume construction of Jingle Palace with the assistance of the State Planning Commission and the Hubei Provincial Department for the Preservation of Cultural Relics. On January 5, 1987, work began on re-erecting the stone turtles. Guided by experts from the Provincial Relics Department, workers made a sticky paste using 100 kilograms of glutinous rice boiled together with lime. This paste would be used to glue the stone parts together. Two cranes working simultaneously were utilized to restore the stone turtles to their original positions.
Following this, the Danjiang Kou Municipal Government earmarked the surrounding area as the exclusive site for the reconstruction of the palace, which would be surrounded by a thousand meter protective wall. Fortunately, most of the cultural relics lost during the Cultural Revolution were retrieved and subsequently placed inside the wall and under close surveillance. When filing an application for the ancient Wudang building complex to be listed as part of the world's cultural heritage, experts found themselves in a dilemma when discussing whether Jing Le Palace should be included. In the end, the idea was abandoned, and this is why Jing Le Palace is not listed in the World Cultural Heritage List. Before reconstruction of Jing Le Palace began, China's established ancient building expert Luo Zhiwen came to Danjiang Kou to look over the site. When he saw the huge stone turtles and the stone parts from Lingxing Archway scattered about, he felt disheartened. He said, All I want to do is hold them in my arms and cry. With help from a variety of sources, work on reconstructing Jingle Palace officially began. However, while workers were trying to restore Lingxing Archway, they found that only five of the six columns were there. One was missing. Obviously, the archway needed to be supported by six columns, not less. But nobody knew where the missing column had ended up. All they could do was make a new one, using stone as similar in colour and texture to the original as possible. Workers had to use explosives to separate the rock from its bed. The first two attempts failed due to lack of experience. Although the third attempt was successful, the loosened rock, about 50 tons in weight, was too heavy to be moved, and so workers had to chisel away at the huge rock to reduce its weight to a more manageable 30 tons. Once this was done, the massive stone was shipped back and carved into a column that looks exactly the same as the other five. It took two years from searching out a suitable rock to the completion of the archway restoration work and relics experts from the Hubei provincial government remained present throughout the entire period to provide on-site guidance. By the end of 2005, the Jing Le Palace restoration project was finally completed after several generations of hard work over a period of 48 years and especially intensive efforts over the preceding five. The Jing Le Palace we see today is slightly smaller than it used to be, but its main structure remains the same, and against the mountain ranges, it looks even more spectacular. That winter, there were several falls of snow in Danjiang Kou, making the newly restored Jing Le Palace even more attractive. And today, below the Longshan Pagoda, somewhere under the water, lies the ancient city of Junzhou and the original Jing Le Palace. For most of us, the names and places belong only in the history books. However, there are still a few people living in Danjiangkou today who remember what Jing Le Palace looked like before the reservoir came. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. I'm Ji Xiaojun from CCTV International. Bye for now.